Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Praise God, our Father's Word, how precious it is. While we're doing some of these special studies, I, I want to do a couple of lectures on how to test your teacher. That means this teacher or any other teacher for assurance that you're not going to be deceived, especially in these, the so-called end times. That's important, it's paramount, it's, it's the most valuable thing that you uh, have is your future in the eternity. Because quite frankly, otherwise you just won't be. So it is very important that you learn how to test your teachers, whereby you become skilled in the Word of God, whereby you can discern again whether you're being misled or whether they're actually teaching the Word of God. Line by line, precept by precept, the plan, the will, and the purpose of God for His children as it is relayed in His Word, are you being taught that? It's so important, beloved. It's, it is so very important, especially in the generation that lives during that time of the parable of the fig tree which will be the last generation. No one knows the hour or the moment, but the wise are to understand the seasons. So let us go into our Father's Word. How, how do we test a teacher? Well, we judge, is he teaching his own words, or is he following the example set by Paul and Isaiah, Daniel, Peter? Because those men taught the Word of God, certainly not their own words. And even while studying in the Word of God, Paul stated in the fifth chapter of Hebrews, where I'm just going to read it to you, you won't have it, for everyone that useth milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, which is to say the Word of God, for he is a babe. If you only go to here, salvation, salvation, and you never get past that. It's beautiful, it's wonderful, it's the first step, but it's milk. You're a babe. You can be a hundred years old and still be a babe in Christ if you don't move past the milk. And then Paul continued in that fifth chapter in the 14th verse, but strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. That's to say mature. Even those who by reason of use have their senses that your mind exercised to discern both good and evil. That is to say, to be able to discern whether God's Word is being taught or it's the Word of men, the traditions of men, which absolutely make void the entire Word of God. So never before has there come a time that you should be skilled in knowing how to test your teachers. And some might say, well, you as a teacher, you're going to tell people how to te check you out too? Sure. As a matter of fact, that's my purpose. If I can drive people into the Word of God, whether they agree with what I might say in supposition or, or a commentary is beside the point. It's that they are driven into the Word of God to study it for themselves, to get past the milk and get into the meat what did Christ, when he raised the damsel back to life, what did he say to do to her? Give her meat. He didn't say milk. That was the, the deeper meaning, was that she was a babe and needed strong meat to strengthen her, whereby in God's word she would be able to, with the girl symbolizing his people, that she would be able to sustain herself. So. We'll stay with Paul for a little bit here in how to test a teacher. Basically, you can those things that you are warned about by 
the disciples and apostles are the things that you most want to hold dear when it comes to the fact of testing a teacher. Paul was speaking a little bit on this line in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I want you to go there with me. And in this chapter 2, in that uh, second chapter, we read in the first verse, For themselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you that it was not in vain. We didn't come to you with a bunch of empty words. We didn't come to you with the void of power either, for they walked in the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 2. But even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know at Philippi, I mean, uh, thrown in jail the whole bit, we were bold in our, um, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God much, with much contention. Now, whose word was it that they taught? What were they bold in? The word of God, not their words, not Paul's words. But whether it brought on contention or not, he boldly taught the word of God. I'm going to tell you something. It would seem that some people draw back from the boldness that is required to really exhort listeners to the Word of God. And I must say, I find it difficult to do it any other way. I'm not patting myself on the back, I'm, but it is God's love in wanting to keep His children's hands out of the fire, that He disciplines us and teaches us. Christianity without discipline is milk. You must discipline yourself. That, basically, the word disciple comes from the word discipline. And you must discipline yourself in the Word of God, and yet we all fall short, but you can be bold for the discipline of the Word strengthens your faith, and your faith is the tap root to, to uh, overcoming. Verse 3. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanliness, nor in guile. In other words, there was, it was straight on and boldly as we exhorted. There was no deceit entailed therein. Verse 4. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel. With what? With the gospel. That's the good news. Even so we speak. That's what we speak. Not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. You always want to follow a teacher that does teach the Word of God. Yes, it may put you at odds with him spiritually, or your little old emotions for a moment. But you'd better appreciate um, that teacher for having brought you the word of your father who dearly and truly loves you. And his word at times stings us all, but stay away from the traditions of men. Well, what, just really what are you saying, some might say, that if if a teacher teaches you something other than this gospel, this word of God, both Old and New Testaments, what is he teaching you? Is he a disciple or, or a, uh, an apostle of God? Of course not. If he's not teaching God's word, he's not from God. Stay away from men that say only those things that are men-pleasing statements and are run contrary to the bold exhortation of God's Word, which is good for body, soul, and spirit. Verse 5, For neither at any time used we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness. We didn't try to please any of you for the sake of gaining time or place uh, with you. But we taught God's Word, even though, and you must remember, he has stated, even though contention and even jail was involved uh, at this time. Verse 6, Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you. We 
nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. We might have been a burden to you, but we didn't seek your praise, and we didn't seek your attention. Verse 7, But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherishes the, her children. Now, many will say, well, that means gentle. You should never be bold. No. How does a, how does a nurse cherish a th- love, that is to say, her children, those that she's in respon- uh, placed in responsibility of? If one of them comes to danger, what is she going to do? If one of them continues to do a thing that is of severe danger to the child, let's say that a, that a little child continues picking up or is exposed to a small object that he could swallow and it would choke him. If, if necessary, pretty soon that nurse uh, is going to be very uh, uh, bold. But why? Because she hates the child? No, but because she loves it and it's in her responsibility within under her cloak of overseer. And she's going to correct the child. And uh, at the same time, that nurse can be ever so gentle. And so the apostles were when they were allowed. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted into you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. In other words, the Christian love grew. And in departing that word, we were able also to fellowship. Verse 9. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. We worked. Um, Paul worked at his trade. He made his own way. And yet at the same time, he taught that gospel. Verse 10, Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. Now, beloved, what has Paul said there that you could test a teacher today by? He wasn't a burden to them. The word carried its own weight. Paul wasn't a beggar. And I would say to you, Beware of beggars. The one thing that Christ said don't take with you is a begging bag. And if there's anything that I can hardly stand, it's a begging preacher. And all they've got on their mind is money, money, money. Gimme, 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 gimme. Do you know, are, are you uh, dense to the point that you can't recognize the fact that that's ungodly? Should a teacher teach tithe? Of course when the Word and the Scripture brings it up, but not a continual stream, whereby it's out of balance. God, with God, everything is in balance. So, absorb the truth. Learn how to discern and test your teachers. Verse 11. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. In other words, that says a lot. A father naturally loves his children. Paul loved this congregation. But a father also chastises his children at times and boldly and gets quite stern in his discipline for his family that they do not fall into the hands of evil ones or, or, or get in trouble. So must your teacher, if he sees you arriving at the edge of the cliff, he's supposed to pull you back. With the Word, the Word does the pulling. All He does is teach. Now, I hope you understand that the title of this particular lecture is Test Your Teachers. I didn't say test your evangelist and and know the difference between an evangelist and a teacher. A teacher is a teacher of God's Word if he is a man of God. But a teacher of the traditions of men is a teacher of the, what? The church system. Verse 12. That ye would walk worthily of God, who hath called you, volunteered you, no, called you, unto his kingdom and glory. He's called you to his own kingdom. Your father, your heavenly father, utilizing Paul, Peter, all the disciples and prophets 
to call you to his own kingdom. Why? Because you are a child of God. And as a father, he's concerned for you. And yes, sometimes his word perhaps may sting. But after the sting, it heals with love and understanding. And you're a much stronger, better person for it. Verse 13. For this cause also, thank we God without ceasing. Because when you received the word of God, received what from him? The word of God. That's what you received from a teacher. The word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it. Not as the word of men, not as the traditions of men, but as it is in truth the word of God which effective, effectively, um, effectual, effectively worketh also in you that believe. That word, once you get into the meat of it, it works and it instills in your mind and that produces knowledge. Beloved, a teacher of God's word is not a teacher of the traditions of men or the saying of men. Neither should you accept the sayings of men <clears throat> as the word of God, for it isn't. That's why that people that set themselves up as teachers and they're only one verse Charlie's that <clears throat> might come down on their case for their benefit as well as for their congregation's benefit. Am I a judge? No, I'm a teacher. I don't judge people. I don't judge that what they're doing is by name, singling out people or anything of that nature. The Word is able to do that. And if one is guilty, they should desist and teach the word that makes healthy body, mind, soul, and spirits rather than a bunch of wimps that are spoiled in the traditions of men. People that are able to stand a little um, opposition because they know that in serving God sometimes there is contention in Satan's world. Verse 14. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea, that's to say from Jerusalem, are in Christ Jesus, Yeshua. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. Now, I'm going to document in the next verse that we're not talking about our brother Judah. We're talking about those Kenites that claim to be of our brother Judah and ca cause our brother Judah a great deal of difficulty. Listen to the next verse. Who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us and they please not God and are contrary to all men. So, what does that mean? Our brother Judah is not contrary to all men. He's one of, 12, one of the twelve of the tribes. He's exactly like the rest of the tribes. Uh, our brother Judah is. But these that would uh, cause Judah great difficulty by claiming to be, and we will document this totally and completely before we complete this subject of testing your teacher. Don't listen to things that are contrary to God's word are the ways of our people. Or you're going, to, you're going to be hurt. You're going to be let down. So, inasmuch, this, the Kenites, which is, those of you that are not familiar with it, it is a Hebrew word that means translated fully rather than transliterated, the sons of Cain. They are very much in the world even to this day. And yes, some of them claim to be of our brother Judah. The practice began way back in the 35th chapter of Jeremiah. Oh, that's only, it began long, long before that, all the way to the garden. But it is written there as to how they went to the land of Judea. That's why I'm stipulating it. Which is to say, the area of Zion. And they moved behind the wall for their own protection. And you see, it is correct to call yourself, if you live in the land of Judea, a Judeite, for the simple reason because of residency, such as 
If I live in Arkansas, I'm an Arkansan. It's, it's a, it's a um, geographical title, not a racial title, all right? So here Paul is saying, don't be afraid of a little opposition. Now, for example, the last few verses I have read from this word, many people steer totally away from them. Though it has to do with the subject matter, I steer away from no scripture because it is necessary for our rounded Christian belief. And this will become more meaningful to you in the next lecture as we speak more concerning the testing of the teachers. Okay, another good teacher was our dear friend Peter, who taught in such a way that with boldness, though he denied Christ thrice on the, uh, on the night that, um, that Christ was crucified, that spirit left him and he became ever so strong. I want to turn to to uh, 2 Peter, and here I am in 1 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 2. And we're going to read about 10 verses here from this 2 Peter. Now listen to the warning that Peter brings forth at this time. Chapter 2, does your teacher teach these scriptures? But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Do you know that there, uh, it, it, uh, it amazes me, do you know there are millions, not millions, but hundreds and hundreds of ministers today, teachers filling pulpits that will not make a strong stand on the virgin birth? I don't know how, why they even call themselves teachers of God's word. But as never before, it would seem, as you have heard me say many times, Satan enjoys working from the pulpits and with the scriptures. I know many people are not aware of that because they don't pay attention. But as I stated in a lecture recently given, what tool did Satan use to deceive Christ when he was tempting him in the wilderness in Matthew 4? Satan didn't use great promises that were traditions of men, but he used great promises from the Word of God, twisting the Scripture, and he did. Every Scripture he quoted in Matthew 4, he changed it just enough to make it void. Beware of a teacher that does this. Be very careful. Be very careful of a teacher that will not allow you to question him, to ask for documentation. That's one reason that I have chosen the format that we use with questions and answers. Verse 2, And many shall follow their pernicious ways, their evil ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. They'll even speak evil of the truth. Example, uh, just mention comment, the comment. To deny or to not make a strong stand for the virgin birth should be evil spoken of and the man has absolutely no business handling the word of God, much less trying to teach it without the conviction and the foundation to stand upon that gives him the blessings of God. For if he does not have the blessings of God, those that support him that are under his uh, covenant, his congregation, they won't be blessed either. Not for what they hear from him, maybe their personal lives, yes. But they will actually speak evil against a teacher that does teach God's word. That's what Paul is saying. I'm sorry, Peter is saying. Verse 3. 
and through covetousness shall they with feigned words, that means lies, all right, fabricated words, make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. In other words, God is well aware of it. God pays attention to what is taught in His name. Some of it He doesn't like. Verse 4, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, this is recorded in the book of Jude, and quite frankly, I might say in passing, this word hell is the only time this word tachrus, the dwelling place of the, the um, prison of the giants, is mentioned in the word of God. Otherwise, it's Hades, uh, Gehenna, or what have you. Okay, but Peter is saying there, is no, there are no exceptions, even back to the kibbeh, the overthrow. It's been the same. God doesn't miss a trick. God understands and knows all things. Verse 5, And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. He destroyed all that were not created in the natural sense of God's way, that is to say by the fallen angels uh, taking Adam's daughters to wife, and all were hybrids except Noah's family who was a perfect generation. The word generation means his genealogy, his, his pedigree, if you take it to the prime in the Hebrew. They were still pure. The others had mixed. Verse 6, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow. That's making them an ensample, an example, a type unto those that after should live ungodly. Even today, if you think God isn't aware, look back at Sodom and Gomorrah because it's going to happen again and delivered Je uh, Lot, vexed with uh, the filthy conversation of the wicked. Verse 8, For that righteous man dwelling among them, this one Lot, in seeing and hearing, what? The word of God, not the traditions they were going by, vexed his righteous soul, from day to day with their unlawful deeds. It upset him, it disturbed him. Verse 9, The Lord knoweth how to deliver. Now I want you to sharpen up. Many of you worry about the tribulation. You listen to me. I don't care if you were standing in the middle of the tribulation as Lot was standing in the middle of Sodom and Gomorrah. There was an example of how he can deliver you directly out of. Okay, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. And so he does. So again, Peter warns you, there would be false teachers, but God would be aware of them. Now, how do you, as a student, learn to test? You align them with God's Word. If they are teaching traditions of men, if they're teaching one verse of God's Word and then going on a rampage into other subjects to, uh, about, and there's nothing wrong with using an analogy, but to make an entire sermon of analogy and never coming back to the Word is not teaching God's Word, but the words of men. Practices of men. Some of them are good. Some good examples could be set forth, but don't label it teaching God's Word you're intelligent enough to know when you're being taught God's Word chapter by chapter, line by line, and verse by verse without someone having to tell you. So, your teacher should teach God's Word and, and not his own or not someone else's Word, not textbooks of uh, the so-called given church, which ultimately, if you're not careful, will run back to the traditions of men. And that's all you're studying. 
God's Word is the most important word on this earth or anywhere else. It is on, the governments will pass away, and this earth age and heaven age will pass away, but God's Word is eternal. Why don't you go ahead and learn it? Because if you're around forever, you're going to need to know it because it's going to be around forever. God's Word does not perish. God's Word, when you dip into it, takes you off of the milk supplement diet and gets you into the meat whereby you grow with a little maturity, whereby the first hot breeze that comes by, you don't get your feathers singed and run like a, a little chicken. But you're able to stand up when, the, when it's tough. And that's why I always say, for God's elect, when it's too tough for everybody else, hey, it's getting just right for us. Just right to plow real good. Now, let's go to the New Testament, to the teachings of Christ. Let's go to Matthew, the book of Matthew chapter 7. Oh, let's pick it up with verse 15. How about Jesus himself, Yeshua? Can he tell you how to test your teachers? And a warning as well. Verse 15 of Matthew chapter 7. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are raving wolves. Now what is this? Or is this wolves of the field? No, they claim to be prophets, which means they are filling a pulpit. It's a church person. And they have on... Um, they have on the, uh, the, the, the sheep's dress, clothing, to make them look like one of the people. And they're raving wolves. Rather, feeding off the sheep, share, ripping off the sheep, feeding off the sheep, pretending to be something they are not. Prophets are supposed to be shepherds that help tend the sheep and love them, not rip them off. Jesus said, beware of false teachers. That's what a prophet is, verse 16. Ye shall know them by their fruits. He tells you a real easy way to test your teachers. If you don't understand the Hebrew, if you don't understand the Greek, Jesus said, I'm going to give you a real simple way. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns, or figs of thistles. In other words, you test the fruit of the man. If he is a man that teaches God's word, the fruit of his tree will be that God's word is expounded upon and goes out. That's good fruit, for it produces good fruit. But if a man claims to be a tree or a vine that teaches God's word, and all that comes out is his own words rather than the seeds of the living word of God, what kind of fruit does it produce? Does it expand and make the word of God grow? Most certainly not. It may even hold its own in a good uh, church climate. Good old boy. Makes everybody feel good. Pleases everybody so they just keep coming back because, after all, everyone should attend church. But that doesn't do you any good, nor does it prepare you for the eternity to hear a good old boy give you positive thinking. Not that it hurts anything, either. It does, it does no harm. But if he claims to be a teacher, then it does harm, for he's robbing you. You are supposed to support a ministry because it teaches the Word of God. If it does not, you're being robbed. Or you're only, you're not, you're not supporting God's Word, you're supporting that man. Jesus is being very plain here. He said, if you, go up to, if you go up to a fig tree and you get a thistle off of it, have enough sense to know there's something wrong. 
if you go up to a man that's supposed to be a teacher of God's Word and all you get is one verse out of an hour's study or something, you've been robbed. Now, there are cases where you could spend one hour on one verse as long as that is the subject and the object and it locks in on that one verse. But if you, if you go off on tangents of dear old so-and-so and out here and around the circle and back into the path and the subject and the object are lost in the flow of the conversation and traditions are brought into it, that is not the Word of God and you're being robbed. Jesus makes it very simple to tell. Verse 17, Even so, very, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. It will not grow. If that tree is a producer of God's fruit, it will grow and nothing can stop it. But if it is a corrupt tree, it's going to be pretty stale, pretty st maybe even stable may even grow a little bit with a revival and a lot of pouring on of the hot syrup, hot, sticky, oversweet, sticky stuff that's almost sickening. Milk, milk, milk. No strength or meat to develop the bones. Okay, I think Christ said take a look at the tree of life. I'm the tree of life and that's what is symbolic of Christ. Satan is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if you get too far away from the tree of life, you're going to slip over into the evil and be deceived. Okay, let's go on to the next verse, if we may. And verse 18, A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. It's just impossible. God's word will not bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a, good, a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. It can't. It won't. 19, Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And ultimately, that's what will happen to those that will claim to be teachers of God's Word and rather teach the fruit of men. The fire is a consuming fire, our Father. Verse, verse uh, 20, Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Can you tell there? Jesus teaches in such a simple way. You don't have to be a super sharp person to, to know when you've been, someone's pulling a funny on you if you go to an orange tree and reach up and pull off an apple. All right? 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. You may claim to be a Christian, but you're not coming into my kingdom. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Not the traditions of men, but does the will which is the plan of God, which is this word. He will end up in heaven. Why is it important that you test your teachers? Because if you hang with the funny bunnies too long. Verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? I'm a preacher, Lord. I wore the cloth. I had my collar turned around for you even. And in thy name have cast out devils, question. And in thy name done many wonderful works. I mean, after all, we were the largest church in town. 23. And then will I profess Unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity, you that work evil and sin and claiming to be espousers of my word and all you have is a bunch of funny stories. Now, there's nothing wrong with humor. God has a sense of humor. But what I'm saying is anyone that professes to be a teacher of God's word, let God's word be taught or get away from them. Otherwise, you're being robbed. Why? Why this? Because God expects a virgin bride for Yeshua when he returns. And many of them that do so great wonders in the name of Jesus. There is a spurious Messiah appearing very soon. And they're going to pay great attention to him. That's why Jesus, if, if the most important things that a church is supposed to teach are not taught in those churches, they're going to worship the wrong Christ. 
the wrong Jesus instead of Jesus, which is to say Antichrist. He's coming first. And if your teacher doesn't even know that, how possibly could he have taught you? Because that is the teachings of the gospel, that he shall, and that many, many, many shall be deceived. And the base root that Satan uses to bring about that deception is certainly, is certainly the house that claims to be the place where God's word is taught. Now, enough said. I hope and I pray that you are not one of those that God will, Jesus rather, will say, hey, I don't know you. Get on out of my sight. No, this great teacher, that was Christ teaching then. His word, listen to it, pay attention to it. Jeremiah chapter 8. We'll go back to the Old Testament. Is this a new thing that we are saying? We're going to go to 8.8. 8. Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 8. Even back at this time when people were about to go into captivity of Babylon, even as that is a type of the going into the captivity of Babylon of the old Re book of Revelation, in this day, this time, this is what he said. How do you say we are, chapter 8, verse 8, Jeremiah, how do you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? Question. Lo, certainly in vain made he it. The pen of the scribes is in vain. In other words, the scribes themselves... <coughs> have changed what God said, is what is being said here. Verse 9, The wise men are ashamed, that they are dismayed and taken, that means tricked. Lo, they have rejected the word of the Lord, that's to say the word of God, and what wisdom is in them? It's certainly not God's wisdom if they are not taught the word of God, but rather the quarterlies and the summerlies and the yearlies and the biannuallys that are written by the scribes to twist them into, I'm not saying all are, but that's why you should stick to the word of God rather than church material. A teacher, and I'm speaking, no, I'm not teaching or speaking to evan uh, concerning evangelists, but teachers. Verse 10. Therefore will I give their wives unto others, and their fields to them that shall inherit them. Do you want to know why it's wise to be strong in God's word? You don't fool him. You don't con him. For every one, from the least even to the greatest, is given to covetousness. From the prophet even unto the priest, every one dealeth falsely. In other words, from the very pulpits themselves, covetousness and uh, begging and uh, uh, so forth are being uh, brought forth falsely from the pulpit of God when God's word should be taught and the teacher should have the ability to re-correct that that some scribe might misquote or set in a church system. And let the children have wisdom from their father, for all wisdom does come from God. How would God give their wives to another? Antichrist. Verse 11. For they have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. And I'm going to tell you what. Peace, peace means the one world system comes in and peace talks here and peace talks there. You are in that generation and you had better wake up and get your head out of the sand. And, and understand, there will be no peace until the true Prince of Peace returns, who is the husband who will take the true bride, that is to say, those that are learned in the Word of God, God's election, that shall stand against the falseness regardless of the persecution, which there will be very little because of the boldness. Verse 12, were they ashamed then that they committed abominations? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore shall they fall among them that fall in the time of their visitation. They shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Do you know why they didn't blush? They don't know enough to know they're doing wrong. To be called, I study under a teacher when he's a one-verse Charlie. 
They don't know enough to know. They don't know how to test the fruit. That's why it's important that you learn how to test your teachers and even your church. In the next lecture, we're going to go into detail of how you do that, not from my word, but from the word of the living God. All right, listen a moment, please. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. They go to hell. I mean, it, it, talk about a bad trip. It is really a bad trip. And then go back to 1 Corinthians 10, 13 and know that God will never have let, let anything happen to you that isn't common to a lot of people. He will never test you over what you can cut. And he'll always show you a way out. Now you get cracking. I want you to read Mark chapter 13 and understand that you must stand against the false Christ and you can't do it if you're a druggie. Nobody listens to a drunk or a druggie. So you get cracking and you, you toughen up. Discipline yourself. Why destroy yourself when you have a beautiful eternal life right there? The door's open. Walk in. That's the scripture. Walk in. Present yourself to Almighty God as a servant. Dennis from Florida, would you please explain the scripture that says those that are dead shall rise and those that are alive shall meet them? Seventh Trump, 1 Corinthians 15, 52, wink of an eye, last trump out, that's the farthest one out, the seventh, Christ returns, we are changed, all flesh is changed instantly into a spiritual body which those that have already died are already in. They're not out here in a hole in the ground. Okay, we have two bodies, and that's what you want to pick. You want to back back up at 1 Corinthians 15 verse 35 and start reading about a little grain of corn. What happens to it? That's what happens when you plant these old uh, flesh bodies in the ground. A beautiful new plant springs up. It's your spiritual body, but it happens instantly. It doesn't get planted in the ground. Ruth from Michigan. What is the key of knowledge and what is the key to the kingdom and what is the key of David? The key of knowledge you will find in, first, uh, in uh, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7 will give you the key of knowledge. Okay. And the keys to the kingdom are the key of David. And the key of David is to know David's genealogy through him who came from the stem of Jesse. And umbilical cord to umbilical cord would come the Christ child. And, um, and that key, knowing the genealogy of David, you know who the Kenites are. That key let you, you know, there was only two churches that Christ was pleased with, Smyrna and Philadelphia, in Revelation one, uh, 2 and 3 chapters 2 and chapter 3. And they both taught the same thing. Do you know what they taught that Christ was pleased with? They taught who the children of the synagogue of Satan was that claimed to be of our brother Judah, giving him a heap of trouble. But they do lie and are of the synagogue of Satan. True churches teach that, or Christ is not pleased with them. And if you're in a church that doesn't teach that key of David, that who the Kenites are, sons of Cain. They're here today. 
You're supposed to know and not follow false teaching, but if you're teaching that fact and who Satan returns to, of course, his own children, <clears throat> then if you don't know that, you don't have the key of David and you're kind of in a heap of hurt, but you can fix it. Do you know how? By studying God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, maintaining the scriptures I forementioned. That's the light that shows you the way. Christ. Daniel from Kentucky. What is the meaning of amen? Was amen in the original text of the Bible? What are your thoughts on that? Well, my thoughts are what it actually says. Yes, it was in the original Bible, and it means that's that. Very final. What it means is that's the way it is, like it or lump it. Okay. That's as it is, that's that. And you, you don't argue with it. You don't abuse it. What God says, I've given it to you. What are you going to do with it? That's that. That's the way it is. Okay. So amen means quite a bit. It's very final. Michael from Kentucky. Pastor Murray, I am interested in studying the Bible more in depth. What text resources do you recommend and where can I find them? Also, you mentioned some cassettes or CDs of your teachings. I've looked online and they are not available. Can you uh, tell me where to find them? Well, you dial that number you see on our screen and request a tape list, okay? Yeah, they'll send it to you. And we have... Um, you would find the text that we recommend in, in our library, books in our library. And naturally, I highly recommend the Companion Bible, the one we carry. Okay. Gail from California. Thank you, Pastor Murray. I have learned so much. Uh, will God create turmoil in your life if you are one of the elect? How do you know the difference between God creating turmoil or or your life just getting out of control. Um, I, I want you to make a note of Jeremiah chapter 23, along about verse 34. Um, God can create a little action in disciplinary ways, but what you want to be careful of, and you're knocking on the door, is don't ever say what burden does God send on us because God doesn't send burdens. And I kind of I kind of sense that in the way you put that. Okay. Uh, we bring them on ourselves. And if you read Jeremiah 23, starting with 34, you know what God tells you there? Don't ever let some preacher wake up in the morning and say, I wonder what burden God's going to send today. Because God doesn't send burdens. Men bring them on themselves. And God said, if you say that, and if you claim I'm sending burdens, I'm going to dump the whole wagon on you. I'll see that you get burdened all right. So that's a good way to get in a bunch of trouble. So I, rec I recommend that you read it and pray about it. And then Antoinette from Kentucky. Pastor Murray, I enjoy your Bible. Well, thank you. It's if your husband cheated on you and you get divorced, you got divorced. Would I be a, would it I be in a sin if I start dating again? Well, if you repent and Christ forgives you, you have a whole new start. Okay, it's um, I, I know that that isn't commonly taught in some churches, but Christ forgives sin. Um, divorce is not the unpardonable sin, and Certainly, you weren't the one that committed adultery. He was. And Christ will forgive you for that, and you are free to not only date, but to remarry if you so choose. Sharon from Tennessee. Is it against Jesus' will to be cremated? It is not against Christ's will. You know, when, when you are cremated, your spiritual body is already with him anyway. It, as it is written in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 6 and 7, instantly your spirit intellect, soul returns to him, but your flesh goes back to dust. It doesn't matter how it gets there. You're through with it. Why would you want it when you have the beautiful body you've got that is your spiritual body? N no problem at all, okay? Melvin from Colorado. 
The leaders in the last days shall be minds of children. What scripture can I find that in? Isaiah chapter 3, verse 4. Isaiah chapter 3, verse 4. God stipulates very clearly that you mess up like that and I will put children as your leaders. Um, God always keeps his promises. Um, Marie, that is, especially when he has given you the right to choose those leaders. Mary, Marie from uh, Indiana, if your child is 18 years old and won't obey you and is rebellious, what should I do? She lives with me. Well, you're the head of the house. It's your casa. You need to lay down some laws. Children love discipline whether they raise sand about it or not. And you are the head of that house. You're responsible. And now that she's 18, she can do what she chooses. But not in your house, not in your casa. Okay. That's, that is your right. And she should respect you as her mother for that. Uh, do it wisely, gently, and always explain why you do it. Okay. And do it God's way. Well, we're out of time again. I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word. Most of all, God loves you for it. You know what? It's the letter He's written to you. And when you study it chapter by chapter and verse by verse, it makes His day. And when you make His day, boy, is He going to is He going to give you a good one. Why? Because He loves you. Let Him know that you love Him in return. Won't you do that? One thing, uh, we're brought to you by your tithes and your offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, when you bless God, He will always bless you. But there's one thing that's very, very important, and it's this. Like that seventh chapter today, remember, you stay in His Word. Every day in His Word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus Yeshua is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.